Internship Up with Sienna, and part two of my interview with Melissa Gilbert. You work so closely with Michael Lind, and as I can tell, um, what inspired you about him? He had the most incredible work ethic. He worked so hard. You know, he, he not only acted in Little House of the Prairie, he executive produced it. He wrote, I don't know, every other episode for at least the first couple of years and directed every other episode. And he was a consummate professional, but was also so comfortable in what he was doing that he was able to make the atmosphere really light and collegial unless you were unprofessional, in mm -hmm. which case there would be a problem. So I watched, I not only watched him work really hard, I also got to be very close with his family. Mm -hmm. And we all vacationed together off camera too. And his then wife and my mom were besties and his kids, we all went to the same regular school too. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Michael Landa Jr. was my prom date. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so he also was very devoted to his family as well. And the other thing that inspired me about him and informs every job I'm on is he had so much respect for everyone on the crew. Mm -hmm. And he actually suggested that I follow each person around at a different point and learn what their job was and how they did it mm -hmm. so that I would have an understanding and respect for the ensemble process of making films and television so that I would never think that I was so much more important than anybody else. And mm -hmm. that's a huge lesson for a nine-year-old. Definitely, yeah. And that's what I've been learning doing my show too, because I've been interviewing everybody from the editor to the production designer, to the actors, to the directors. And I'm getting to learn like of everything that they're doing and what they do for a living extraordinary how many people have to have so much skill to make a really good television show or a film or a great commercial mm -hmm. and how interdependent we are on one another and if you take one person away it falls apart it's not you know the actors are not the end all be all you need the craft service people and the greens greens <laughs> and the makeup people and the people who do casting and background casting and you need grips and electricians and you need a gaffer. And you got to respect all of those people um, because no one's more important than anybody else. Definitely. I definitely agree with that. I've learned that a lot from doing this show too. Um, and how did you get the nickname Half Pint on the show? <laughs> uh, well, actually... Uh, Charles Ingalls, the real Charles Ingalls, did call Laura half pint of cider, half drunk up, which <laughs> typically would be a quarter pint, but only if you're a math whiz. <laughs> um, so he called her half pint for short. And when we got to the set for when we were shooting the pilot for in the beginning, Michael Landon came over to me and he said, so we have two Melissa's. We have Melissa Sue Anderson playing Mary and we have you. She goes by Missy. What nickname do you want? And so I said, well, how about um, Moisha? <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, M Moisha, what? That's an old Jewish man's name. Why Moisha? And I said, I don't know. I heard it somewhere. I think it's kind of cool. And he said, no, 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 no. We're not calling you Moisha. We'll call you Half Pint. And that was it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You've been in so many other productions. Um, and I recently, like I mentioned earlier, watched um, Miracle Worker. And I thought it was amazing. Um, I heard in an interview, you um, said you need special coaching to play the role. Um, when you can see and hear um, in real life, how do you tune out everything to play that role? That's, that's where that coaching came in. Because you know we did it as a play first. And I'd never been on stage before. So it was my first play. And um, same cast, everybody was the same. We did it in Palm Beach, Florida for six weeks before we did the movie, which was great because it gave me a lot of time to figure out what I was doing. <laughs> but when we were getting ready to leave the rehearsal space in Los Angeles and go to Florida where we did the play, uh, the director sat down with my mother and said, we've got a problem. She's just not in it. She's not, there's, she's missing something really fundamental. Yeah. So my mom called my called her old acting coach, a man named Jeff Corey. 
who I'd worked with once on Little House in the very beginning because I had to do all this narration. So he worked with me to find something that hooked in to me for the narration. And actually that was, he told me to read the narration like I was a grandmother uh, telling stories to my grandchildren. And that's mm -hmm. where, and it changed my voice and it worked. So for this, uh, and I remember I was sick. I had strep throat Ooh. and we went to his house and he took me out to his um, work room, his like office outside of his house. He lived in Malibu and he put earplugs in my ears and he turned out all the lights and he blindfolded me and basically threw me around a room for about an hour. Oh my God. So <laughs> that I yeah, so that I had an idea of what it was like to have that kind of sensory deprivation and find my way through life. And one of the th many things I discovered was that I was always afraid to go forward because I knew where I had just been was safe. So when you see the miracle worker, you see me constantly reaching out, but reluctantly, because I'm afraid of what might be in front of me. I might walk into a wall or trip over a chair. And, and that's that I remembered, I remembered that physicality. So that's where that movement came from. And it just sort of all clicked in at once. And I'll never forget the first preview of the play, our first audience, they had an entrance for me where they were, the adults were on stage saying, you know, where's Helen? Oh, here she comes now. And they look up center stage and I come running straight out from the house on the back of the stage straight out and down right to the middle of the stage on the end and stop with my arms out, like reaching out. And the first time I did it, the people in the first two rows stood up to catch me. And in my little 14 year old brain, I thought, my well, God, them, this is fun. And I, they, they absolutely believed I was blind and deaf for the rest of the play. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, um, and what was the most memorable role you've ever played? <laughs> um, I think the most uh, career-changing, life-changing, game-changing for me, aside from Laura Ingalls Wilder, obviously, which changed everything, was playing Helen Keller, for sure. Uh -huh. It took me as a performer to a completely different level and imbued me with this sense of... Um, confidence and adventure that I hadn't really had up to that point. Like I, I knew I could do what I had done, but now I knew I could do lots of other things. Mm -hmm. And so it excited me to continue on and really challenge myself. And I think it really kind of clued into this thing I have where um, if a job comes my way that I find scary, I have to do it. Yeah. Like doing a musical at the age of 40, having never done a musical before. That was scary, but I had to do it. I can also see how that was probably a big like impact on your acting career because it kind of teaches you like how another side of how to act like not only emotionally but physically too. Yeah, absolutely. And learning how to take care of myself for a a, a whole different genre of of acting. Eight shows a week is a completely different. Um, I have to take care of my body and a, and my mind in a completely different way than I do if I'm on a film set. Yeah. And, um, and those things I found, those things that are really challenging and scary are the things that kind of level you up, not just professionally, but also as a person, because you start to, you start to really accrue um, experiences and knowledge. Mm -hmm. And did you ever get hurt when you were doing, like, at least when you were practicing, did you like get hurt at all? Dude. Yes. Um, I got hurt a ton on the miracle worker, especially in the play, because there's a giant fight scene in the middle. You know, the fight in the over the breakfast. Oh, yeah. We'll do that live on stage eight shows a week. And the slapping across the face was all real. Oh, wow. So we really beat the crap out of each other. Yeah. <laughs> Daily, sometimes twice a day if we had two shows that day. Um, and since then, I mean, I have, yeah, I've fallen on stage. I've fallen off of the stage. I've gotten on horses that ran off with me. Um, I've slipped and fallen on sets. I've tripped over things. I've done stunts that went wrong. 
I yeah, I'm I'm kind of a cobbled together Frankenstein sort of <laughs> monster person with all the parts that I've broken and fixed, and I've done so many shows in you know a uh, um, a soft brace on my wrist or a soft brace on my foot or a broken toe or a broken finger, but. I'm, I'm a bit of a, I, I had a dog who used to just run into walls and stuff and I called him a gung-ho puppy. And that's what I am. I've always been a bit of a gung-ho puppy. <laughs> and um, did you have an idol or a mentor as a mentor as a child actor? I, I loved, as a kid, I loved the, uh, the work of um, Shirley Temple. Mm -hmm. I loved the work of... Um, Margaret O'Brien. I love to watch Natalie Wood uh, as a child too, and a young adult. Um, so those were my those were my inspirations. Mm -hmm. My mentors were Michael Landon. Patty Duke was absolutely a mentor and like a second mother to me up until she passed away just a few years ago. Um, and I've I. I've had the opportunity to work in so many different ways with so many different people. I, I kind of take something away from each of them, like working with Patricia Neal, I got something on Little House on the Prairie, working with Victor French on Little House on the Prairie, I got something, working with George C. Scott in a movie, I got something from it. So I'm, I'm a bit of a sponge that way and I absorb things from the people I have the opportunity to work with. Definitely. And you were the president of the Screen Actors Guild from 2001 to 2005. Um, why did you decide to run for president? Well, uh, a few years before that, I had um, sued the National Enquirer for defamation for a story they wrote about me, um, calling me a deadbeat mother, which made me mad. Mm -hmm. And really, really mad, like mad enough to sue somebody. Mm -hmm. And Screen Actors Guild, then at that time, the president was a man named Richard Masser, who had been a friend of mine. And he and the guild had a board meeting and decided to support my lawsuit. They signed um, an amicus brief or a brief of amicus, which in legal terms means, I've also played a lawyer on TV, you absorb so much stuff when you play different people, um, that they uh, sympathize and support my actions. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up settling much to my satisfaction in that lawsuit. And so I went to Richard at Screen Actors Guild and I said, if you ever need me, I'm happy to run for the board and come help out in any way. And he called me a few years later and said, we need you to run for the board. So I ran for the board and I got elected. And at my first board meeting, a group of people came over to me and said, presidential elections are coming in just a few months we need you to run for president. And I said, I need you to realize that you guys are crazy. <laughs> I can't do that. And they said, do you think any president, there's no school for it. James Cagney, who was the first president of Screen Actors Guild, didn't know what he was doing. Nobody did. And Patty Duke had been president. She was the second female president. And I called her and said, what should, should I do? And she said, absolutely. You'll learn more about yourself doing this than you will doing anything else in your life. Mm -hmm. And she was right. I mean, I learned a lot about um, my limits <laughs> and ability to say no and my ability to govern and my ability to stand by my convictions in the face of really difficult political shenanigans. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I it definitely, I, I learned a lot about the industry, a lot more than I ever had before. I mean, you know, how often in anyone's lifetime do they get to negotiate a $200 million contract? <laughs> and I had some really incredible experiences. It was a very stressful thing to do, which is why it could only last for two terms, but it was definitely worth it. Again, it scared me. So it was a leap. Yeah, definitely. What was the most rewarding part about that? Well, the most rewarding part was being able to make sure that the members were protected and cared for and properly compensated when we negotiated that contract. That was a big deal. Um, it was very difficult to come up against that kind of political opposition. Internally, Screen Actors Guild has, it's a two-party system, just like our national politics are. Mm -hmm. And you hear how we've become now nationally, when you read the news, you see how 
um, confrontational people are and how they don't listen to each other and they just get locked in their positions and they bang heads. Mm -hmm. And the volume of it now, you know, it, it's led to a lot of violence and a lot of anger in the general public sphere of politics between Democrats and Republicans. Screen Actors Guild was always like that. Um, <laughs> it's always been confrontational. And, you know, it's a room full of actors, so it's very emotional. And there's a lot of screaming and a lot of crying and a lot of pos uh, uh, proselytizing and a lot of uh, rhetoric. And um, it's, it's, it's very difficult to get business done in a room where the emotional pitch is that high and people are that upset. Yeah. So my job was just to kind of calm everybody down and quiet things so that we could actually have a conversation to help the membership. Mm -hmm. Frustrating to say the least. And knowing what you know now with all of your experiences that you've done, what advice would you give to your teenage slash like tween age self? You know, teenage, tween age me was, was, I think, just the same as any teenage, tween age young person. Mm -hmm. uh, same insecurity, same worry, same freaking out about stuff going on in my body, same uncomfortable, God knows, with the metal in my face, not making things easier. Um, I think I probably would have said to myself, relax. Everything will come in time, slow down, enjoy each day. Don't worry about what other people think. It's all going to be fine. Your teeth are going to be gorgeous. Your <laughs> boobies are coming. <laughs> Just wait, slow down, I think would be the best, the best advice. So I've done this with a few of my guests before and it's called, it's kind of like a rapid fire question. So what's your favorite movie? My favorite year. A uh, hobby you love? Knitting. Uh, first song that comes to your mind? Our house in the middle of our street. I have no <laughs> idea why. I don't even like that song. Um, chocolate chip cookie or oatmeal raisin cookie? Oatmeal raisin. Uh, roses or tulips? Roses. What is something that scares you? Uh, hatred. Um, favorite ice cream flavor. Favorite ice cream flavor. Um, uh, gooey butter cake. Mm. Uh, Jenny's gooey butter cake, or um, just vanilla, boring but true. Yeah. Um, and vacation at beach or vacation at the in the country. Beach. Um, and I know that you were on Dancing with the Stars and I love dance. I actually have danced today, later today. Um, and I love Dancing with the Stars too. I watch it all the time. Um, and I watched some clips from when you were on it. Do you have from doing that experience, like a favorite style of dance? Um, I studied dance my whole life. I, I was a ballet dancer. So I love any and all dance. I studied tap, I took jazz, I took hip hop class at one point, um, but I'd never done ballroom dancing before. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really, really hard. I mostly liked my, was it my samba trio? It was my trio with Max and Val. Was it a salsa trio or samba trio? It was one of the two, but that was the most fun I had. Uh -huh. And um, Laura Ingalls Wilder said, it is the sweet, simple things of life, which are the real ones after all. Um, what are the simple things of life to you? Health, mm -hmm. uh, a roof over my head, um, being able to squeeze my grandchildren, uh, spending time with my kids, and waking up every morning next to my husband. Um, and you just completed my 10 rapid questions. Um, I want to thank you so much for doing this interview. I had so much fun talking to you. Um, and I'm probably right after this, after I finish my homework, I'm going to watch the Muddle House on the Prairie. Um, and I, I, lo I love this show and I had an amazing time talking to you. 
Oh, me too. Uh, this was really, really fun. Thank you so much. I'm so glad it worked out. Thank you so much. Got it. Take care. Have a great dance class. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much, Melissa, for taking the time to speak with me about the amazing roles you've had on these movies and TV shows. It was a true honor to speak with you. And now, before we search it up, here's a quick fun fact. Walnut Grove, where Little House on the Prairie takes place, is actually a real city in Minnesota. And now it's time to search it up. Let's see. Oh, Jason Bateman, he was in Little House on the Prairie as a kid. And he also appeared on The Simpsons, which means we're circling back to The Simpsons. Well, see you next time to talk about The Simpsons.